welcome to the show. My name is Marty Otanias. This is Getting High on Anthropology, a story-based approach to cannabis research, education, and funding. Uh, tonight on the show, we have Jessica, and she's uh, her job title is Grow Lead, and we're going to have a discussion tonight about occupational health and safety issues and learn a lot about cannabis, <laughs> okay? So uh, welcome, Jessica, and thank you for taking your time and to be with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, so one of the questions to begin with is, for people who've never heard of a grow lead, <laughs> uh, unpack that term. What is a grow lead, and then what would be like an ordinary day for you? Yeah, um, as a grow lead, basically what I do is manage a department um, in our warehouse where we grow all of our cannabis. Um, I particularly manage the mom department, so um, that's where we keep all of the mothers for clones that we cut to get our daily production plants. And I'm so glad you mentioned moms because uh, for people who are not familiar with cannabis, I wouldn't go to a facility where you work and see a dad's department, right? It would right. be moms. So what's the importance of females in uh, cannabis production? Good question. Um, so the importance of using clones instead of seeds is that there are no males. When you cut a small branch off of the mother plant or the moms, um, and you put that into a little rooting medium, it's an exact replica of the plant that you're cutting off of. So it has the same gender, which is great because if you have males, they'll pollinate the females and um, anybody who uses cannabis knows that you don't want the pollinated stuff because it's got the seeds. Okay, and so in the job that you have, when you're overseeing the moms, what would be like the one thing that you have to really watch out for to ensure that the moms are healthy? Um, like, is there one thing that like you really got to pay attention to to avoid any you know crop failure or plant failure? Sure. In addition to the basics of you know light and food and things that plants need, your number one problem is always pests. Um, yeah. okay. <laughs> pests are always out to get you. And then, what would be uh, one pest that you see regularly? Um, powdery mildew, which I know you're pretty familiar with. And out here uh, in Colorado, we have the two-spotted spider mite is probably one of my biggest nemesis. Okay. Um, well, Jessica, let me give people a little bit of background of why you're here. Um, as you know, I'm a professor of anthropology at UC Denver, and I have a funded research project by the University of Colorado Denver Office of Research Services. And the research project is looking at occupational health and safety issues in cannabis grow houses and trimming rooms. And the purpose of the research is to identify what are those issues that workers understand to be um, health, hazard, health hazards or to be um, harmful to one's health. And so I learned uh, from you and others that powdery mildew is one of the problems that uh, I think is underneath the entire industry. I've heard even people say there's like an epidemic depending <laughs> on what, what year we're in. So before we go deeper into cannabis and then your work in one of these facilities, give us a little bit about your background. Uh, like, did you have any specialized training? You know, what was kind of the route that you took to get to where you are now? Um, I actually have no specialized training, believe it or not. Um, I've always been interested in plants. My mom had house plants and a garden growing up. Um, I actually went to school at UC Denver for music business, um, so I didn't know I was cultivating a passion for plants, but then uh, when I got out of college, was trying to make a little extra money, that's when I learned that I'm very passionate about plants and particularly growing cannabis. Okay, and um, then in terms of music, your interest in music, do you still do anything to pursue or advance your musical training at all, or is it, are you done with that? Um, I'm still a little bit involved in the local scene, um, helping out local bands and things like that um, with their booking, uh, but I'm not largely involved. Um, growing has taken over my life to okay. a large extent. And one of the reasons I asked is because I love music. I've been very lucky to travel uh, mostly in different parts of Africa doing research projects. So I have a big collection of world music. Oh. So if we were to get together and consume cannabis, what would be like the soundtrack or album that you would put on to make sure we had an optimal time? Oh no, I'm gonna be so stereotypical <laughs> and say probably a Pink Floyd album. I could, I could <laughs> go with Pink Floyd. But my other option would be some Modest Mouse. Okay. Great. It's not very worldly, but that's what I'd choose, man. And I also understand you, um, uh, and I think you mentioned this, a stage hand. Is that, uh, yeah, tell us yeah. about that. Um, I haven't been picking up a lot of gigs on that lately, but um, 
that's a good time. You know, someone's got to set up all those giant stage props that Lady Gaga has. Someone's got to set up the giant things that Justin Timberlake swings from the ceiling from over the audience. You know, someone's got to set up Usher's fancy green room. So when you're stage and that's what you do. Huh? That makes it sound a little bit less difficult than it actually yeah, is, no, but that's but what's going on. I bet it's a lot of fun when you were oh, yeah. able to do it. So one of the questions I wanted to ask you, thinking back um, in the past few years, uh, why don't you tell us about, with your knowledge of the cannabis industry, what would be one of the disturbing things that you've learned um, so far with your experience in the sector? In terms of disturbing things, uh, largely around the, the product itself, was that when I first came in, there was very little regulation on pesticide use. I mean, little to no regulation at all. And, and pretty much no regulation whatsoever on what people wore when they were spraying in the rooms. So I was uh, concerned when I found out how little y control there was over how much was on the final product and how much workers were exposed to real, uh, real pesticides. Right. Um, since then, one of the most interesting changes that I have seen in the industry thus far has been when they changed the regulations and they got a little stricter and made it so we can only use more or less organic pesticides. That changed our whole outlook because honestly, before they did that, pest control wasn't a problem. Mm -hmm. We didn't think about it. We didn't scout for pests problem solve, make environmental adjustments to try and cut off the life cycle, none of that. You spray Eagle 20 once a week, nothing is alive in there right. except for the plants. It's pretty There's not spiders, there's not flies, there is nothing. But yeah, once we couldn't use that anymore, I honestly thought it was great because of course we have that toxic pesticide out, but I got to learn about all these pests and stuff, but it was a huge influx of pests that we were like, oh wow, this is a whole different game now. Mm. So what would be the implication of what you're saying for the product back then? Would the product be just infested with chemicals or like what would be if you look down the supply chain? Um, I mean, it wasn't, at, you know, I can't speak for every company, but it wasn't to the point of negligence or anything like that. Um, but it is hard to say, you know, how much of what you spray when makes it to the finished product. Of course, anyone who's growing knows not to spray too much later in uh, flowering cycle because that'll damage your harvest. But beyond that, there wasn't a lot of research into how much residue makes it for how long and any of that kind of stuff. So um, there were limitations as far as like, oh, we don't spray within say three or four weeks of harvest. But beyond that, you know, I don't honestly know what <laughs> was getting through and what wasn't. Right. That's what I thought was disturbing and that I was really happy to see cleaned up. Good. So what I'm hearing, there's been some positive development that today yeah. with some of the new regulations um, and the regulations being forced, workers aren't necessarily exposed to a lot of the overspray or chemicals and then mm -hmm. the, the consumers getting potentially product that's not infused with um, pesticides. Yeah. Definitely. Um, and one of the things I learned about you um, a couple weeks back is that you have this love for plants at home. So why don't you tell us about um, some of your experiences with your own cultivation and then how that translates into you being a, a, an effective worker in the cannabis facility. Some people will tell you you can't learn anything about other plants by growing cannabis, but that's nonsense. If you have a vegetable garden, you're going to be able to grow infinitely better pot. You know, learning about growing vegetables has helped. Not only do you have a wider like, classroom to learn from for all the pests and applying beneficial uh, nutritional stuff, and you know, it's, it's a big classroom, basically. Right. So um, the bigger your classroom, the more teachers you have there, AKA plants, the more you're gonna learn. And you can always take that any garden you go to. Yeah, no, I love how you frame things, like you humanize these plants in terms of teachers oh. um, and giving them a gender, which is obviously very important. So for someone like me who has been 
not so knowledgeable about growing plants at home. What would you say to someone who's about to cross that line and grow things, you know, as we get out of winter? What would you, what advice would you say to kind of get going and do it well at home, growing either cannabis or vegetables and, and other things? Bottom line uh, advice to a beginner is that your number one thing is going to be the environment that you're putting your plants in. So whether it's an outdoor garden or an indoor garden, um, you're going to need to have a few things sorted out. Like do you have proper airflow, proper lighting? Inside, obviously, it's about buying your lights and getting your light timers and that kind of thing. Outdoors, you want to make sure that your position, you know, do you have street lights? Do you have a fence? Mm -hmm. Do you have a tree that's going to block your sun in the afternoon? What do you got going on out there? You're going to have to make some decisions as well as checking out your airflow. Just making sure, like, is this an environment where some plants can grow? And then you build from there, you know? Okay, a lot of variables. A lot of things could go wrong. Oh yeah. Yeah, oh, no, yeah. this is, um, I'm inspired. I may, you know, <laughs> if I talk to you this time next year, I may have a, a nice uh, uh, set of plants that um, would be uh, great to show you. Oh um, yeah, let me know if you have questions anytime. Uh, the thing that I think for someone like me who wants to home grow cannabis, what would be the startup costs? You know, if I wanna, you know, grow a decent number of plants, what would be, to get me going, like how much would you suggest to think about in terms of spending? <sighs> That's a, uh, Broad question, um, largely dependent on if you're doing indoor or outdoor. Um, indoor, I would say, you know, with any garden, keep in mind that you want to do it right up front, get it out of the way. If you have to go in and rebuild it, if you have to go in and dig it, something up that you previously put down, you know, just go ahead, spend the money, do it right the first time. Um, that being said, I think you should allot about two grand to get started in your house, depending on what your goals are. Mm -hmm. You know, if you allot that much, you're gonna get started, no problem. Okay. Um, outdoor, depending on how big your operation is, what you already have back there, I mean, under $1,000, you can probably get started. Okay, no, I might uh, follow up on this and, and, you know, with the cash up front, I can't wait to see these plants that I'm able to grow. Let yeah, it's all about growing smart instead of, I mean, don't just throw more and more nutrients at it. Don't throw tons of synthetic stuff on there and bulk it up and all this stuff. When there's organic natural solutions. If you're starting up, I always recommend to people go with the easy stuff, you know, at like making up a super soil that's going to keep your plants fed for quite a while instead of relying on a machine to feed your pump or to feed your plants every four hours or having to check your uh, PPM and pH levels every single day. Like you don't need all that stuff when you're a beginner, right. you know, start with the basics. And then if you want to get fancy, you can slowly do that, you know, over time. Okay. No, this is great information, Jessica. I really appreciate it. Let me take a second. I want to remind viewers you're watching Getting High on Anthropology. My name is Marty Otanias. I'm the host and co-producer. Uh, very excited tonight. We're speaking with Jessica. Uh, we have a live audience here at Denver Open Media, so I just want to make sure viewers understand uh, at any time when we have some taping here, you're welcome to come down and participate in the show any, any way you want to. We're at Denver Open Media, uh, which is an organization that promotes community access to media, the tools that you can have to make your own media and have uh, stories that you can tell as opposed to other people telling the stories for you. So you're, if you haven't been to Denver Open Media, uh, come down. They have some great volunteers here, great equipment, and it is a membership-driven organization, so consider becoming a member at Denver Open Media. So I have a guest tonight, Jessica. She's a grow lead in a cannabis facility, and let's continue our discussion with this issue of powdery mildew. So for someone who is new to the cannabis sector, what is powdery mildew and why is it a concern? Uh, powdery mildew is a concern for not just cannabis growers, but all gardeners. Um, so lots of people might be familiar with it just from what they've seen in the garden and didn't even know. Um, powdery mildew, it looks like some fuzz on the leaf surface and it's just what it sounds like, mildew. Um, it grows exclusively on plant surfaces because that's how it draws its moisture. Um, once it has spread into the plant, it remains kind of in the plant tissue, almost like a virus. So once a plant has had it, even if you get rid of the 
fruiting body, so to speak, once the conditions are right, it can always come back. So it's really tricky to fight for that reason. And have you ever trimmed or done any job tasks where you were exposed to powdery mildew? <laughs> yes. Um, you experience it quite a bit growing. And this is in a, a facility that produces cannabis that's sold in shelves and dispensaries in Colorado? Yes. Okay, so would you say, if you are exposed to it, um, what are the precautions that you can take to protect your health to avoid any symptoms or reactions like respiratory problems or rashes? Um, so what would be one or two things you could do to, to protect yourself? We do always keep uh, protective clothing and stuff around for our workers. Um, so we always have a P95 dust mask, so that um, that is sufficient to keep out most mold spores. Most mold spores are gonna be over three microns, I believe it is, wide, which is what a P95 will block out. We also uh, standard wear gloves all day and we'll have sleeve protectors, so um, if you're reaching into a group of plants, you know, um, we'll often wear those to protect our arms. So okay. we do have protective equipment available. When harvesting, if we're particularly concerned about mildew in a room, we'll actually do a full body suit, like the suits that we use to spray pesticides. And then what about <coughs> if you were working next to me, training me to like trim weed, um, what would be one or two things you would share with me to be knowledgeable or alert when powdery mildew is in front of me? Um, especially if you were trimming because you might be dealing with slightly drier material, but in any situation, you want to be aware of, you know, not just grabbing it and tossing it in the trash can like this because it's spores and they want to spread. So what you want to do is isolate the situation. Um, alcohol, like isopropyl alcohol, will uh, do a pretty, uh, pretty good job killing most of the spores. So that's a good thing that you can keep on hand in a spray bottle. And then if you see a little on a leaf, then what I like to do is spray my thumb with the alcohol, wipe it off the leaf, and then cut that part of the leaf off. And then, you know, that little patch is dealt with. Um, that's on a growing plant. If you're dealing with powdery mildew on an already harvested plant, similar situation. You just kind of want to get it, isolate it, maybe spray it with alcohol without spraying the bud, and then throw it away without moving it or, you know, exposing it to any other buds if at all possible. Okay, so there does seem to be some remedies, some uh, ways you can do, oh, yeah. uh, what you can do to keep it at a minimum. Have you ever, um, uh, experienced powdery mildew and had any harmful effect or any symptom that was a direct function of that exposure to powdery mildew? I've never had a symptom or reaction that was so severe that I was like, oh, it was definitely all that powdery mildew. I will say that sometimes in, uh, you know, spring and fall can be heavy powdery mildew seasons for various reasons uh, with an indoor grow. And during heavier seasons, sometimes it might be a little more coffee or, uh, you know, runny nose or whatever, but I also have seasonal allergies, always have. Got it. So um, powdery mildew is probably something that lives outdoors and contributes to everybody's seasonal allergies. Okay. Um, so that's my personal experience. So um, besides molds and powdery mildew, um, what would be another occupational hazard uh, that you've seen or experienced in a cannabis grow facility? Yeah, um, there's some occupational hazards that are pretty common of other physical labor occupations. Um, so heavy lifting, you know, I'm always telling my guys, you gotta stretch it out in the morning, man, because if you hurt your back, it's gonna be a real bummer. You can't, you can't grow if you can't lift. Um, you know, there's always water on the floor. When you work with hydroponics, that's just gonna happen. I don't care how good you are at it, mm -hmm. there's gonna be water on the floor. And so you can always slip, you can be carrying hev heavy things and slip. And so, uh, you know, it can be a little bit of a dangerous workplace in that sense. We're using sharp objects like scissors and scalpels to get our tasks done nice and clean. But other than that, it's not a particularly dangerous job at all. Okay. Um, what about, from what I've learned from you and others, um, the storage of the pesticides? Any concerns about fumes from pesticides? Um, that is 
another occupational potential hazard, although I feel pretty comfortable with all of the products we use that, I mean, we're, uh, we have like an isolated little tent with a fan and that's where we're supposed to mix up all of our pesticides. All the pesticides live in a locked cabinet that has a little fan coming out of it. So everything's um, designed to be well ventilated and stored in like a uh, fireproof cabinet. So it's pretty well regulated and when we're mixing it up, we have like full body Tychem suits, gloves, rubber boots, face masks. Um, the type of face mask depends on the pesticide and what it recommends on the bottle. So very thorough protection and um, a lot of protocols in place to try and keep that all really safe. Excellent. No, that's really good to know. Um, what's interesting to hear you talk about your job is from what you've said and others, it does seem to be a workforce, at least in the grow areas, where it's predominantly men. And so how does it feel to be like a woman in an occupation where it's predominantly men? Um, or have you found certain opportunities or limitations because of being a woman in a grow house? Being a woman in a grow house is definitely a unique uh, experience. I am the only woman currently in the grow house that I work in. Um, so of course, that's <laughs> a great time. I love, I love my guys though. Um, I would say that, I mean, just purely not that many wing women come through. I mean, we've had like three women come through in the time that I've worked there, like two and a half years. And I mean, it's physical labor, you're sweating, you're kind of, you know, it's a uh, not traditionally very ladylike job. Um, I also think that there's a historic past there um, in that with growing weed being illegal, I mean, I don't know if this is a stereotype or if this is backed up by anything, but it seems like men will do a little bit more risky things than women, and that's why more men were growing is when it's highly illegal. And I've heard a lot of explanations for this. Women have families. Women have, you know, parents that need, they need to take care of and kids that they need to take care of and they're trying to provide for, you know, and they've got goals. That's one explanation I've heard. But whatever the reason is, there was a lot more men growing before it became legal. And although I see more and more women getting interested, it's just not going fast, gotcha. you know? Well, I'd like to see you as a role model for young women who want to get into cannabis uh, cultivation. So what That's would what you I try to be. What would you say to a, a young person, 18, 19, who she aspires to have a job like yours, but is a little concerned about, you know, bro culture or, you know, this heavy, you know, dude mentality that exists in the grow house? I would just tell her, you know, it's all about the plants at the end of the day. There's more ladies in there than there are guys because every plant we're working with is a lady. And Women have a nurturing quality to them that can grow better pot when applied right, in my humble opinion. And so um, when you put your mind to the plant and don't let anything else get in your way, it's easy, you know? And you find that the guys back there aren't, I mean, they're just fellow growers, you know? I'm close friends with everybody I work with and I don't find it difficult to get along with them or anything like that, even though there's just one of me. So um, it's opening yourself up to being friends with them because when you start acting like I'm different, they're different, we're different, then you are. Mm -hmm. Could create tension. You know, it's just life. Yeah. But well, <laughs> it's good. Especially in a grow. Yeah. Well, it's good to hear that you've been able to navigate, um, you know, the culture there, and that you're enjoying the job, and you seem that you have this, you know, love for the plants. Um, one thing that I thought that stood out is this idea of educating the employer about how to properly grow. So <laughs> if if you were confronted with a group of investors that wanted to get into weed, what would you say to them to ensure that they have the knowledge to do it well? And then what kind of retraining would you have on an ongoing basis so they're successful? Boy, I wish my bosses would ask me that question. Um, my advice for anybody who wants to get involved in the industry investment-wise is just like my home grow um, advice, which is that just do it right the first time. Get a building and custom build it for growing 
marijuana. Because if you don't, you're gonna have to go in and redo every little thing as you go, and it's gonna end up costing you so much more. You know, if there's just a tin roof in the warehouse you wanna grow in, put some dang insulation, or put some insulated paint, or you know, if you got a concrete wall that touches the outside, it's gonna get cold when it's different temperatures inside and outside. You gotta put some copper paint on that kind of stuff. And overlooking these seemingly tiny details, the first time around, it's gonna cost you. It's gonna cost you in your harvest, it's gonna cost you in time it takes you to troubleshoot why the heck you have all these problems. Just go make a custom building for growing. Well, Don't I'm, half-ass it. I'm really glad you said it the way you did and I hope employers watch this so they can have <laughs> some uh, way forward. So we're gonna wrap it up, but I wanna ask you, do you love your job and if so, why? Oh, yes, I definitely love my job. Um, I love working with the plants and I love knowing that I'm providing something to the world that is a medicine, whether you use it recreationally or intentionally medicinally, it's a medicine for the social, you know, culture we have going on today, medicine for the soul. It's the healer for the uh, human condition, if you ask me. And so it gives me pride and pleasure to provide that to the world through whatever means I have. Well, great words to end our conversation. So let me remind viewers, we have a guest tonight, Jessica. She's a grow lead in a cannabis cultivation facility. And I'm Marty Otanya's co-host and, uh, sorry, producer and co-host of Getting High on Anthropology. I wanna thank you for tuning in. And um, you can find Getting High on Anthropology at fsandgreen.org. See you next time. Mm -hmm.